to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your host for Commission Ed. In today's episode, this one has been requested many times, but is a great follow-on to the discussion that we had last week with Captain Johnny Jopling. Today we are bringing you a Judge Advocate General, a 51 Juliet Captain Karina Osgood, who is going to help us understand the role of the UCMJ, how the JAG functions in the Air Force, and their relationship with commanders, the mission, and every airman that's out there. Yeah, we're going to talk to it more in detail, but the law is everywhere. So pay attention, listen, (laughs) because you got to know this stuff. The more you're in, the more you're going to interact with them, and it needs to not be bad things. You need to not freak out. When you hear JA, you know, your heart rate needs to not go up. So yeah, yeah. As you'll see in the interview with Karina, they want to help. They're good people. They love the Air Force. And so let's turn it there over to Captain Karina Osgood. Captain Karina Osgood, welcome to the Commission Ed podcast. It's such a pleasure to have you here. How are things going? They're going pretty well. Pretty well. I'm just living day by day, you know, having adventures as they happen. Yeah. We were catching up a little bit before we turned the mics on. You've had some pretty exciting things in your very short career in the Air Force. Not to say that, you know, you can't accomplish a lot of really great things in a short amount of time. But, you know, as the audience is going to learn, JAGs do things a little bit different. Their path into the Air Force is a little bit different. Their promotion schedule is a little bit different. And you know what? That's all good. And so super excited to bring you into the podcast today. Share your experience and peel back the curtain on what it means to be a JAG, which stands for Judge Advocate General. Is that correct? Did I get it right? That is correct. We are known as Judge Advocates, but we belong to the Judge Advocates General Corps. So obviously we're going to be JAGs, but it's easier to say it that way. Yeah. Okay. Well, so we're going to get into all of that. But first, before we do that, let's turn it over to you, give you the opportunity to introduce yourself, tell the audience a little bit about who you are, where you come from, how you got into the Air Force, why the JAG Corps specifically because it's not something that is handed to you. You have to seek that one out, right? So share a little bit about your background, and then we'll get a little bit more into the JAG career field. All right. So, I mean, I'm Captain Karina Osgood, and I'm a native of Northern California. I'm actually currently stationed at Beale Air Force Base in Northern California. How did you work that? I I was actually surprised when they called me up and told me I was going to Beale, but I took it for what it was, and here I am. There you go. Okay. Been here for the past two years, uh, two and a half, actually. And my current job that I'm doing that I just started is called a Special Victims Council. And I'll get into that later, of course, as well, go into detail about what I do. But the way I got into the military is actually started off pretty early in my life. So when I was about 13, I decided I want to be a lawyer. That's what I knew I wanted to do. 13? Yeah. I liked arguing. I mean, I like making my point, right? I wanted to be right. I like to analyze things. (laughs) I love to read. That's who I was. And so, oh man, I'm sure you were a joy as a child. Oh, there was always like a, well, why? (laughs) Why is a great question. I love why. So that was me as a child, you know, always trying to get the answers, always trying to prove my point. And when I was 13, I decided I want to be a lawyer. And as time went on a couple of years down the road, I was thinking, I really, I do want to do the law, but I've always had interest in the military, like something to serve my country, something to be in uniform. I am actually a lover of uniforms. Like you put me in a uniform, if there's a job with a uniform, I'm there. Okay. So that's kind of how I was. And I thought, I really want to do something in the military. I just don't know how I'm going to accomplish that. So it actually turned out to be an interesting situation in which I had a friend that commented to me one time, I'm actually a member of Civil Air Patrol. And I said, Okay, what's that? Right. And he told me all about it. And he's like, oh, it's an auxiliary of the, of the Air Force. It's for civilians. It's a really good, like, youth program for leadership. You learn how to drill. You learn how to, to salute. You learn all the different things about professionalism and being what an officer would be like. And he told me, you should check it out. So I said, oh, 
why not? I'll check it out. So I went. So this to was my, in high school? Yeah. So I was about 15 okay. at the time, turning 16. And I went to a meeting and checked it out. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm sold. Like, I am doing this thing. They were wearing uniforms. <laughs> of course I want to do this. They were uniforms. Yes. So of course I was there. <laughs> so when I started that off, I started also researching a little bit about career fields, you know, trying to figure out if there was going to be a connection with the military. And I found out that there was a thing called the JAG, the Judge Advocate General. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And as I did more research, I realized there are military lawyers. Like, huh? Yeah. I didn't realize that was even a thing. I had never crossed my mind that uh, I guess the military needed lawyers, but now I know it's so true. So that started me off was working in Civil Air Patrol, having those experiences, like learning how to drill, learning how to salute, wearing the uniform, learning about professionalism, got me my start. And then I decided about 16, that's where I'm going. I'm going to be a JAG. So it's kind of a long road from there, obviously going through college and everything. And my entry program was different from how I would say most enter the military, at least from like the, the ROTC side, because I was an ROTC cadet, but it was different for me because there's a couple different entry programs for the JAG. So okay. one of them happens during, after the first year of law school and law school is three years long. Is every law school three years long? Is that just standard across the board, no matter where you go? Yes. It's usually about three years. Okay. Typically there's no summer classes that are taken if you're doing like in person, but there are also some circumstances where they're offering courses online now and you can do it over the summer and try to maybe squeeze in in two and a half, but it's typically going to be about three years long. Okay. So the first entry program is like right after the first year of law school. And it's a condensed version of the four-year ROTC program. So instead of entering as like a freshman in the undergrad program, you actually enter obviously as a law student, but you're doing it in two years. So it's a lot more condensed. You have to do like the ROTC field training and you have to take a bunch of classes that you have to make up for the time that would have been lost. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you'd done a different route, you might've had more time. So there's that first route. The second one is the same exact thing, but it's like a, only a year long. And it happens right after the second year of law school. And that one is super condensed. That's where they send you the field train and you have no idea even what you're doing. You don't know why you're there. And they're telling you, we're going to watch how you lead. And you go, I don't know what I'm doing. So help <laughs> me. And then it's like the classes are super condensed, like doing 300 level classes, 400 level classes in the same year, just trying to catch up. And then the final route, which I'd say is more common than not, is to have people enter once they're graduated. So like third year of law school, they're going to pass the bar. And then they go into the Air Force that way doing what's now, I guess, considered TFOT because OTS got replaced. So that's more the normal route. RTC is a lot more competitive. But I had my sight same time, I guess. And I thought, well, I'm just going to go ahead and compete from the beginning. Like, why not? I know what I want to do. Yeah. So I applied first round. And didn't make it in because it's, it's a super competitive program. There's only like, I want to say at best, maybe 15 tops to get selected per year from all the law schools in the nation. So I didn't make it that year, but I thought, okay, I'm going to try again the following year. And of course, it was my luck that I got it on the second round where I had to do everything in a super condensed time frame. In the one year program? <laughs> the one year, they're sending me to field training and all this stuff's happening. I'm going, okay, well, I'm ready for the wild ride this is going to be. So, uh, But you at least had had the Civil Air Patrol, so you had some context to draw upon as opposed to, you know, going in completely blind, no clue what an Air Force uniform even looks like. You at least knew how to wear the uniform. Oh, so yeah. you had at least some advantage. Absolutely. In fact, it was nice for me to have that background because I was with about eh, nine other people that had gotten selected and none of them knew anything. I didn't yeah. know how to wear the <laughs> uniform, didn't know how to march. And at least I had that background so I could help out here and there. So that was kind of a comfort for me because it wasn't as shocking, I think, as it would have been otherwise. So that's how I ended up going through the program. And then obviously commission was in the reserves for a little while while I took the bar and waited the bar results. And then they had to place me in active duty. And lo and behold, I ended up at the Air Force Base. Okay, so I just want to back up a little bit, make sure that I understand so that the audience better understands exactly how this all worked. So you already had your bachelor's degree. You were going to law school. You were already accepted to law school before you ever started your commissioning training, correct? That's correct. And that's the norm is that you cannot start working toward becoming a JAG unless you already have your bachelor's degree and get accepted into this two-year or one-year program for ROTC, right? Typically, yes. If there's somebody that really knows from the outset that they want to do that, like at 18 years old, they're there as a freshman doing that, they could potentially go through the four-year ROTC program and then after they're about to graduate, like 
apply to the JAG Corps separately. Okay. And then they have to get selected for the JAG Corps. Then they go to law school, and then they're just doing law school while they're technically an officer in the reserves. But that is not very common because most people don't even know what they want to do, you know, at that stage of the game. In my case, I couldn't because I had come in to my university already as a junior about to be a senior. So I had a bunch of transfer credits. It just wasn't going to work for me at the time. Okay. So I postponed ROTC until later on. Okay. And then you say that this two-year and one-year has to be done through ROTC, and that's because you have to do it at a law school, which means that you cannot do this at the Air Force Academy that does not have a law school. Is that right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's an important point for everybody to understand that if you want to become a JAG, should you or should you not go to the Air Force Academy? I mean, I'd say you can as an undergrad, but bearing in mind that your ROTC experience post that's probably you're not going to get where you want to go if you're going to be there doing law school, if that makes sense, because there's no law school to do. So I would take that into account when you decide if you're at the Air Force Academy is for you. It's not necessarily a detriment if you choose to go elsewhere for law school, but I mean, it's just something to bear in mind. Okay. I mean, I guess you could cross train you know, later down the line, right? That is a possibility that you can go to the Air Force Academy or even through ROTC or OTS and get a different AFSC and then later on choose to cross train, apply for the opportunity to cross train either because you did law school on your own or maybe you went through FLEP, Funded Legal Education Program. Is that something that we'll probably want to talk about here in a second? Then that can be another way that you become a JAG. Does that sound right? Yes. Your avenues aren't completely closed off if you decide that the Air Force Academy is really what you want to do. It does pin you into the AFSC that you're given, right? So you have to start thinking after the fact, okay, how do I make myself competitive to be able yeah. to be a JAG? And that's where FLEP comes in, the Funded Legal Education Program. And that one is even more competitive than ROTC. So, I mean, you've got mm. an AFSC, you're in a career field, you're already at that point a captain. And of course, your AFSC doesn't want to lose you. Right. So they want to keep you, they want to make it worth their while. So you have to be competitive enough to say, I offer value as a law student to become a JAG. I want you to pay for my education and I will pay you back in time. Yeah. So very, very few people ever get that opportunity. And once they do, the Air Force does pay for their education. They go to like a civilian law school as if they just were a normal civilian, but they do have to pay that back in time afterwards. Yeah. So I've come across a couple of different officers that were going through FLEP. And by the way, it's also available to enlisted. They can apply for FLEP, be on the Air Force's dime, getting their law degree, graduate, pass the bar, and then receive their commission, come back on active duty as an Air Force JAG. But yeah, I think this program, FLEP, is incredible that just like any sort of funded education program that the Air Force provides, you get to do school as your full-time job. You get paid as an officer, all the benefits, you accrue leave, you have a housing allowance, and you don't have to wear the uniform, which, you know, maybe for you, Karina, that sounds terrible because you love the uniform and... <laughs> Maybe that wouldn't be something that would work for you. But for others, you know, being able to have that time to focus on just their school and maybe they have family, they have kids, they have that ability to spend time with their family, perhaps especially after they've been doing an operational AFSC where they're deploying all the time. It's a good break as they make that transition from their previous AFSC into now being a JAG officer. Absolutely. It has its benefits for sure. Having that change in odds tempo and, and making sure that you have time for family, I'd say that it's something to definitely consider if, if the opportunity were to present itself. Okay. So we've covered pretty well here how you become a JAG, that you can do it through a commissioning program, ROTC. You can do it. You got your law degree. You go to TFOT or you go into the Air Force and then you cross train. There are these various different avenues. Are we missing any? Um, no, not that I can think of because... The one I mentioned was undergrads, but they, like I said, that's one where you do the four-year program in ROTC, then you still apply to the JAG Corps anyway. So there's, it's kind of the same thing as if you were to do FLEP in a way. You're just committing yourself to the time already in the ROTC and being commissioned. Okay. And so that led us up to your graduation. You pass the bar. You receive your commission. You got stationed at Beale. And then what happened? And then what happened? <laughs> What has it happened? <laughs> well, I showed up to my first day of work and it was kind of one of those situations where you realize you know nothing. So 
I mean, I had passed the bar, but I had no practical experience working in the law. So for me as a new LT, first lieutenant actually at that point, I mean, I'd never been in active duty environment. So it was a little nerve wracking at first, quite honestly. And with the promotion systems that we have, it's it also puts a lot more pressure, I think, on us as JAGs as opposed to our other career fields that are out there. Yeah. Because we come in, so once we're in the reserves, we obviously, from ROTC graduate, we become second lieutenants. And then once we're put on active duty, they immediately bump us to first lieutenant. So at that point, we're thinking, okay, there's already at least two years, if not more, of experience in the Air Force is what everyone else is thinking on the outside. Right. Which is so not true. I had like two days. So there's a lot more pressure there. And then about six months down the road, there's an automatic promotion to captain. And I say automatic, not like everyone should get it just because they get it. I mean, you have to be worthy of it. It's still a privilege and an honor, but it's the idea that's going to come to you due to your education. So because we have a three-year degree that goes above and beyond what the undergrads do, we get a little more compensation by rank. So six months down the road, I, I was a captain having conversations with people who outranked me by a lot and had so many years of experience, like leading squadrons and leading like everything under the sun. And there I am just as humble me, giving them advice on things about the law, about military justice, about stuff that was going to affect their people. So it was a lot for me to take in. I think, especially at the beginning, it was like, I don't know anything. So there were lots of questions I had to ask of everybody else around me to help me work through that process. Yeah, it's such an interesting thing, what we do to the professional officers, you know, referring to our JAGs, our chaplains, and then the medical corps, right? These folks who have to get that advanced degree to even receive the commission and that particular AFSC, we throw a whole bunch of rank at you. And just by virtue of how the Air Force operates, with rank comes responsibility and a certain expectation. And, you know, from 10 feet away, I don't see the badge very well. And, you know, the JAG badge does look a little bit different from everybody else's. But, you know, from 10 feet away from, you know, from across the room, all I really see is the rank, right? All I really see is the uniform. And that means a whole lot of things to a whole lot of people for better or for worse. And so it's a really interesting situation that our JAGs, our chaplains, our medical corps are all thrown into without the same amount of training and certainly not the same amount of experience that is gained by our rated and our line of the Air Force officers. Oh, absolutely. It's so different. And the expectation that weighs on us is definitely different because I know that when I first became a captain, there were people I was talking to, like first sergeants and commanders and others who had so much experience. And I know that they looked at me and trusted me to give them sound advice, thinking that I had four years, five years, six years in, and there I am humbly with my six months. And so it was a growing experience for me of taking on that level of responsibility to help out everybody there at the wing and you know, make sure it was done right. Yeah. And you said that in order to overcome that, you had to ask a lot of questions. What sort of questions are you asking and who are you asking them of? Oh, in our environment, we work closely together as attorneys and paralegals. So it's not uncommon to see that our paralegals have so much more experience than we do. Like as enlisted members, just generally, they've had more years and they usually almost all of them have cross trained too. So they've had experience in their career fields okay. and maintenance and whatever it is. And they come in with so much to bring, like so much to add. And I would ask questions all the time of the NCOs in the office of our paralegals just saying, well, how do I do this? Or what, what does this mean in the enlisted side of things? What's an EPR? How does this work? Like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and so they were always there to help out and mentor me because there I am with my two bars and I don't know anything. So I'd say that was a valuable lesson for me as well, was realizing that just ask the question. Like, it's fine to ask the question and there are people around to help. I would also ask a lot of my peers, but it was also, in a sense, kind of a struggle among all of us because we all had varying levels of experience, but for most everyone in my office at the time, we were all first assignment JAG. So we were all there together struggling through trying to figure out how to do it right. So if it wasn't from peers, then I had to go to my leadership and I was going to ask my deputy SGA, who was a major, sometimes asking the staff judge advocate, who's a lieutenant colonel, if, like what to do. But... I definitely had to ask questions. There's just some things that you're not going to know. And you just know that somebody out there has had that wild thing happen before. So that's what I would do. I'd just be like, hey, sir, hello, can, can, I, can I talk to you for a second about this? Because this is rough. Like, I need help. So Yeah, for sure. And I hope our audience will recognize the importance of asking questions and relying on your peers, the enlisted, 
your senior leadership, regardless of the career field that you end up in. This is not just a unique thing to the JAG by virtue of the situation that they're thrown into with a whole bunch of rank, but very little experience. You know, this is something that is true for all of us. We all need to be asking those questions and doing so humbly and doing so frequently. Absolutely. Completely agree. Like, I wouldn't have gotten to where I am now if it hadn't been for all those questions. Even the ones that I thought were silly. Like, just even when it comes down to things like, how do I use my outlook? What are the best ways to look things up and for context? Like, I don't know. And so it was humbling. It was definitely humbling. And I learned a lot. And now I'm not afraid to ask questions because I know that there's going to be an answer somewhere. And it makes me a better person for asking. Well, Karina, weren't you always not afraid to ask questions? Weren't you the one that was always digging deeper, always asking why? True, true. I do like to find the why. So asking questions is just a way to fulfill that in me, I guess, as well. Okay, well, to transition here, I think this is a good opportunity for me to ask why the JAG Corps. Why does the Air Force, military in general, but specifically the Air Force here for our context, why do we need JAGs? Why do we need lawyers? Well, as I mentioned before, my experience, like thinking about the military, I have never considered the military lawyers were even necessary. I just hadn't entered my mind. But the more I thought about it and the more I've, I've become exposed to it working in like a base legal office, I realized that the JAG offer something so essential because a military base is like a community. Like it's like your normal community on the outside world. And in a normal community, you have things that happen. You've got people who get into accidents. You've got people who commit crimes. You've got those who have problems like with real estate. You've got property issues. You've got everything under the sun. And it is so important to have that type of sound legal advice in the military environment because we're talking about decisions that are being made that affect a host of people. I mean, they affect property, they affect airmen, they affect missions, everything is at stake. And I have seen through my experience working in this field just how prevalent it is. Like the law is just everywhere. And we are absolutely necessary in the Air Force to sustain that, to make sure that things are done right, because we are held accountable for a lot as members of the military. Like, we are funded. Obviously, we have to make sure we use our funds correctly. So there's a lot weighing on us. And we are always there as the legal check to make sure that things are done properly and giving the, the best advice that we can and obviously leaving up to the people who make the decisions. Yeah. So you mentioned a wide range of things there that you have to understand a little bit of the law for. You know, there's the criminal side, there's the civil side real estate, law of armed conflict. I mean, there's so much that lawyers, that JAGs have to touch because just as you said, and I love how you said it, the law is everywhere. It is. It right? Is. There's nothing, no you know, portion of planet Earth, the sky above it or the space above that where there isn't some sort of law in effect. And if there's a law, then we need a JAG who is going to be there to help the commander the other people who are carrying out the operations to understand it, right? Exactly. So how do you manage all of that? I mean, how do you know criminal law and civil law and, you know, R&D law, budgetary law? How do you keep a handle on all of these different things? It can be rough. And I'd say that the JAG Corps is definitely for people who don't stop learning because it is always about learning something new. That's what intrigued me about coming in was I knew that I was going to learn something every single time. Like every day could be something different. So I would say that the way we manage that is, you know, by taking it one step at a time by saying, okay, I, yesterday, like I knew this one thing about criminal law today, not something else and relying a lot on peers. I think that's very important is having that support network too, to keep learning and to manage it all when things get hard. I would say that something that's been valuable for me too is to see the practical application of it. Like it means much more to me to see it play out in somebody's life or in the military context and operations than to just sit watching like a PowerPoint presentation about how this is supposed to work. Like my technical school was informative, but there's nothing compared to actually having the experience of watching like, oh, okay, this is how a court martial works. Okay, the PowerPoint that made absolutely no sense to me with all the squiggly lines going places, now I understand the entire thing because I did it myself. So I'd say practical application is how I've been able to manage just the massive information because it sinks in so much better when you get the hands-on experience. Okay, and you mentioned courts martial. So that's the thing that you've been involved with during your time at Beale, is that correct? Yes, pretty heavily. The legal office generally works in like, couple different areas. So as we've talked about before a little bit, there's the civil law stuff. It's like everything that's not criminal law. So it could be 
contracts, it can be civilian labor law, it can be environmental law, um, wills, it can be legal assistance, helping out the airmen with their problems that they have, stuff that comes up in their lives. So there's all that stuff on the side and you have the justice side. And during the two and a half years I was at the legal office, that was what I primarily did. I was in discharges for over a year. I knew that program inside and out. And then I ended up running the justice program as the chief of military justice. So courts martial was my thing. I litigated a lot of courts martial when I first got to my base. We had a pretty heavy caseload. So like I said, practical experience got me so far. Like being in the courtroom, having those experiences, knowing how things work, that's definitely benefited me so much. Was that a pretty normal way for the career path, the developmental path for the JAG is to come in and do criminal or do civil? Do they have it structured in some way that you get to see all of the different kinds of law or do you pick one or get one picked for you and then kind of focus your attention there and your experience and that becomes the thing that you become really good at over the course of the career? How does that all work? So typically assignments in the JAG Corps are going to be about two years long. And the first assignment is always going to be the base legal office. The reason for that is because new lieutenants coming in have to learn a little bit about everything. And JAGs, most often over the first couple of years of the career, are generalists. Like, that's what we do. We just know a little bit about everything. We're not going to be the experts, but we at least know something. It's in the name, right? (laughs) Judge, advocate, general. There you go. Exactly. A little bit about everything. So. The time spent in legal offices to rotate through positions. It's not uncommon to have leadership decide, okay, this person right now has been in the justice position, like the chief of military justice for about a year. Time to switch them over to be the chief of general law or civil law, and they can do that and learn something new. And that is because it creates a well-rounded JAG, like for the future. And also it helps fill the gaps because sometimes things happen. We have people who deploy, we have people who get sick, we've got stuff that goes down. And we cannot have an office where like only one person knows how to run our military justice program. We need to make sure enough people can fill in just in case something were to happen. I think that's a military principle we see everywhere too, right? Like having enough people to do enough jobs so in case something really bad were to happen, we're not just going to be left stranded. Yeah, I like how you said it, fill in the gaps, not just in your own knowledge, but also in the mission that has to get done. The time is going to come when someone has to leave the office either for a deployment or they get sick or they get PCS or something, and you're going to have to step up as a less experienced officer to make those calls. And it's best to have had a little bit of exposure to everything so that you can at least have some context to draw upon. For sure, for sure. And for future assignments, that also plays into it, too, because the experience that we get builds upon, like, every single thing that we do is always going to be a stepping stone to something else. Because, yeah. as I said, the law is everywhere. So just because we're at a base legal office doesn't mean we'll maybe never will see a contract ever again, or we'll never touch a fiscal law issue, because fiscal law issues are everywhere. They're in the deployed right. environment. They're there <laughs> at, the lo- at the local base. They're everywhere. So the knowledge that is gained from a legal office is taken then to future assignments. And then, of course, with more responsibility means that there's more experience to be had. And it just creates this, I think, nice cascading effect of just seeing how the experience just keeps going forward and forward and forward. And all the stuff from the base legal office is actually useful. Like having that time to at least be in the seat, whether it's six months or a year, is invaluable. Yeah. And I want to make sure that we touch on this. Like, it's not just understanding the law for the law's sake there is that practical application that you were talking about. What are you studying and using the law for? How does it apply toward the execution of the operational mission, the support and logistics of the Air Force? How does the JAG fit into all of that? Who are your customers? How are you helping them? Mm -hmm, Exactly. It's about being able to apply that too, because the law is written down. There are rules to follow, but you can't just take like, a black and white situation always and just say it's always going to be this way. There's things that change. There's nuances. There's always gray areas. And it's always important to understand with each new scenario, okay, the laws apply this particular way in the situation I was in before. How can it apply in this particular situation? Because the answer might be different. And one of lawyers' favorite things to say in the JAG Corps and even outside the JAG Corps is it depends. Like, it really just depends. I can't give you a straight answer. It's not because I don't want to. It's just, yeah, it's so nuanced. And having that background of every situation teaching you something, it goes a long way. And you're doing that for not just the other lawyers, but you're doing that for squadron commanders when they're dealing with UCMJ violations, non-judicial punishment kind of things, criminal situations, and also mentioned earlier, law of armed conflict. You know, you're there helping to guide the operational mission in the deployment of Air Force 
weapon systems on behalf of the United States, right? You have a role to play in the projection of air power. Oh, we absolutely do. And I think that's something that's maybe not recognized as frequently because obviously the warheads on foreheads idea is, you know, where the action happens. But there's also a lot of conversations that happen behind the scenes with senior leadership. And there's a JAG always present to that. Like a senior JAG is going to say, here's what I see. And based on the law, here's the decision you can make. And you can do what you like, but here's the advice that I would give you based on my experience, based on the law and what it's telling me. So it's a very important role to have. And in the operational environment, very, very much so. I mean, we're working with foreign partners and doing activities with them. There's going to be things happening like with missions on the classified level as well. You need somebody present there, some legal voice that at least gives information that maybe you otherwise wouldn't see without having that legal background. Yeah. You had the opportunity to do that operationally. You recently returned from a deployment, right? I did indeed. You know, don't have to get into all of the nitty gritty, you know, sensitive details of it, but what's it like being deployed as a JAG officer? It was a unique experience for me, quite honestly, because it was my first deployment. Wasn't expected. It was actually one of those volunteer short notice things where I had two weeks to get myself ready to replace somebody else in my office who ultimately couldn't go. Wow. Two weeks. It was a little rough. Pandemic made up for that, though, so it was a little bit better. But two weeks to prepare for training and getting my life together, realizing I am legitimately going to Africa, which is where I ended up. And being in that environment, something that struck me was working jointly. I mean, I had never worked with the Navy and the Marines and the Army in the way I had in that environment. And so I learned so much by being exposed to the way their systems work. Because, for example... The Army runs their military justice system differently with the paperwork they do or different standards that they have. The Navy has some different things as well. And so being in that environment, working closely with all those different branches was the first thing that struck me as being so, so different from anything I had ever experienced before. And another thing that was interesting was seeing the real-world application, just how a JAG fits into the big picture. Because I think it's easy sometimes to get lost Mm -hmm. at a base where you're just like me out in the middle of nowhere at Beale. And you just think, I'm here at Beale, and woohoo, I don't really know why I'm here sometimes because not a lot's happening. But being in an environment where you're downrange and there's conversations happening about things that are happening like in the world presently, world events, and being part of that and hearing those conversations or being the one to give advice on situations like that. So, for example, not going anything classified, but in the recent past repositioning that President Trump had ordered for Somalia, and our JAG, our Navy JAG, was heavily involved in that, giving advice mm-hmm. all along the way about what to do with the repositioning. And I thought that was cool like, because you don't think about a JAG being involved in getting people mobilized and move places, but they absolutely are. And that was cool working in that environment. Something else that I had done as well that was interesting was I was working for a two-star general. And I mean, I hadn't been a two-star general before, so it was a little <laughs> a little scary at first like oh man this is he's got stars and and i've got bars and this is great so (laughs) but it was cool because i got to in my role as an ethics attorney advise on ethical decisions being made or just things related to foreign gifts because he'd get foreign gifts all the time he'd get Mm. people who come from the french base he'd get people from the italian base all the dignitaries and the important people that would come and have lunch or do a tour and then give him things and so i'd be there to make sure he could accept the gifts make sure there weren't going to be any problems down the road later on that he accepted something that he shouldn't and making sure those things were kept track of. So honestly, I would say that the two big things that stood out to me were the joint environment. Like I can see the mission now and how it's being executed with everybody and how the joint force works together. And then just seeing how the world is so much bigger outside the base legal office, about outside your own base. And so that was pretty cool. Yeah. That was definitely my experience, too. And one of the things that I love about deployments is that you finally get to see how it all fits together. The Air Force and all of the training that you do, how your AFSC is supposed to operate in that operational environment, the combination of the joint partners, the Army, the Marines, the Navy, all coming together for this one specific purpose and seeing that, you know, there's actual like, you know, reason for the madness. And yes, it is madness. Deployments are crazy and chaotic and way super fun. But you finally get to see it all come together. And yeah, there are things that are you know super frustrating and you can't speak the same language as the guy across the table from you who also happens to be in the United States military. He just you know grew up in the Army instead of the Air Force. 
but it gives you that opportunity to work cross culturally, not just, you know, in the different services, but like going to Africa, you know, our joint partners, our coalition partners there, cross cultural experience and opportunities there. Yeah, deployments are fantastic to finally put all of those things together. I'm so grateful that you had that opportunity. You now have that context as a JAG officer because not every JAG gets to deploy, right? Oh, no. It's a very rare thing, I would say, especially with what we're seeing now with certain locations being removed just because things are changing politically, right? And so militarily. So I think there's even going to be fewer opportunities than there were before. And I feel privileged to be the one that could actually go and be in an environment like that because for junior captains like me, it's not that common. Um, we don't have any spaces open. And it's also dependent on, you know, is it your time, your P-band to go or is it not? Right. And then senior leadership positions, there's always going to be those because they're the ones making the like decisions or advising on decisions based on targeting, right? So they're going to be right there, but it's not that common. So for me to have been the one that could go, I mean, honestly, it's an experience that's invaluable to me. And I think professionally is going to help me so much going forward as well. Yeah, for sure. So you finished your deployment, have recently come back home. And now what? What does the Air Force have in store for you? What are you doing or what will you be doing here in the near future? Well, when I got back, I did more quarantine because, you know, pandemic's great for that. And then I did a course PME for a new job that I have, which I'll talk about as well. And then, of course, I did more PME for Squadron Officer School. So that was also great. So lots of PME, lots of time spent on Zoom, which everybody loves that. So looking at where I am now, though, I'm starting a new position that's called the Special Victims Council. And okay. essentially, when you have criminal justice matters, you've got typically three parties. You've got the government, which is going to be all the base legal office attorneys, right? They're the ones advocating for the Air Force. They're advocating for the interests of, of the military. Then you've got your Area Defense Council. They're the ones defending the accused. They're going to be representing them and making decisions for their case. It's going to be the best, right? They're supposed to zealously advocate for the client. Then you've got the Special Victims Council. And this is a newer position in about less than a decade that has come about due to the increase in sexual assaults we've seen in the military and other acts of violence that really require an attorney to be there representing victims. And they didn't have that representation before. So there's a lot of conflicts of interest that can arise when you've got government attorneys trying to prosecute a case on behalf of the government, making decisions for the government and trying to work with the victim, but not taking into account the victim. And I found myself in a position like that as a government attorney, too, where we had a civilian victim, and I was trying to work through being a government attorney while trying to help her, but I couldn't really help her because it's a conflict of interest. So yeah. this position was created to advocate for those interests. And a unique thing about the position that a lot of people don't understand is actually a special victims council is there to represent and advocate for the expressed interest of the client or stated interest. So that means that we are the mouthpiece for what the client wants. And it's different from an accused, for example. So in a courtroom, the Area Defense Council could make a decision about how they want to cross-examine a witness. Their client could be sitting right there next to them saying, do this thing, I want you to do this thing. The attorney could say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that for you because this is the best outcome for your case. And I understand it right now. So let me you know, advocate for you. Yeah, It's different for a victim because a victim has a right to participate in proceedings or not to. And let's say, for example, there's a victim who was sexually assaulted and maybe they have a really good case. Like the government really wants to advocate for getting the, the accused convicted, but the victim just doesn't want to go through with it. For whatever reason, they just don't want to go to court martial. And our role as a special victims counsel is to advise them on all of their options and to say, you could go to court martial. You could also go through an administrative discharge process, or you could also have maybe if you really just want an apology from this person, if that's going to satisfy you, then we can do that too. And the client makes a decision. And then we're the ones who have to transmit that. And there's some frustration that can arise sometimes with squadron commanders or even like government attorneys in the base legal office, because they're thinking, well, what are you doing in special victims counsel? Like, why are you making this decision? And it's not us. Ultimately, we're advocating for whatever the victim wants. Sometimes it doesn't make any sense necessarily, but it's what they want. And so it's a unique role that has been opened up to really make sure that they have a voice, that they're heard in what is a, can be a very confusing part of the military justice process. Yeah, it sounds like what you were saying earlier about nothing ever being black and white, cut and dry. You know, there's a lot of nuance to all of these things, especially when it comes to sexual assault and you know, all of the highly charged emotions that that come along with that you know the 
I don't even have the right words to describe it because it's not something that I've thankfully ever experienced, but it just shows the importance of having you, the JAG, involved in all of these different things from criminal law to civil to budgetary and fiscal to law of armed conflict. That's why we need to have the JAG officer there and present. But as is my want, I want to ask this question, why does the JAG need to be an officer? I think in that respect, why having an officer is so important is because the decisions that are being made are at the command level. Like the things that are affecting people's lives and mission outcomes are happening at the command level. And there's a certain level of professionalism that needs to be there. I'm not saying the enlisted corps doesn't have that. There are so many, so, so many really great enlisted personnel who exemplify all of the core values. But I think in the environment we work in where we've got senior leaders making decisions, it's so vital to have an officer who's either of the same rank or, I mean, lower rank as I am, that can be there and work in that environment. And also because we have to set an example. I mean, as officers, we are there setting the professional standards. And as attorneys, especially, I mean, we are we are considered professionals in in the outside world as well. We have bar licenses. We have responsibilities, ethical duties we have to abide by. And so I think it's a nice fit to see a JAG officer in a position of being an officer, thinking about the fact that they also have their bar license, they have all of those things they have to to abide by, clients, interests, and confidentiality and everything. So it seems like to me a great way to bring two worlds together and also to serve the mission best by supporting our senior leaders in the decisions that they make. I mean, you have the paralegals and you mentioned that it's not that the enlisted couldn't do this job and do it well. How do you see the commission itself, the oath of office, the oath of the officer? How does that play into what you do in advising command decisions and ensuring that standards and UCMJ are being properly enforced and that the Constitution is being supported? That's an, that's an interesting way to look at it in, in regards to the oath. And something that stands out to me about the oath is that we're supporting and defending the Constitution of the United States. And as lawyers, I mean, we do that as well in supporting the laws that are there. Whether or not we agree with them, there are laws that are going to be abided by. And I think that plays a heavy role into what we do in advising commanders because we're supporting the Constitution against all enemies foreign and domestic every time we offer advice about a mission or about even like something as simple as a contract on base, like we're helping to further that, defending ourselves against enemies. I think that's very, very important. Something else that comes to mind as well, just the difference in officership, I think, is from the oath perspective is looking at obeying the orders of the president and all the, all the other officials. It's not something you see in the officer's oath. And there are reasons for that, but I think it's important to from the legal perspective, that we're here as advisors. Like ultimately, we don't make decisions. I'm not making a decision for anyone. But we're just there as a supporting role for people who are actually making those important decisions. And to me, that means a lot thinking about the oath and how that relates to my role and being a professional, like a legal professional and furthering the mission. Yeah. Well, there's some pretty heavy stuff there. We could dig much more into it, but I want to you know, lighten things up a little bit more and give you the opportunity to share you know, a pinch me moment. Yes, you deployed. And yes, we talked about your deployment. Maybe the pinch me moment came from that. Maybe it's from your time at Beale. But when was it that you found yourself thinking, wow, I'm being paid to do this? Oh, okay. The deployment was definitely one where I think I had that thought of, this is my life. Like, I am doing this. Like, <laughs> I'm a lawyer. Why is a lawyer doing this right now? But this is awesome. So a couple of things even before the deployment that always stuck out to me that all of us have to do as officers is we qualify, right, with weapons and everything. We do the seaburn stuff. We're always putting on the gear. Mm -hmm. And I always thought to myself, man, I don't, that's not something I would do as a normal lawyer. Like, I'm just not going to go down to the range and do that as part of my job. But when I went on the deployment, I realized, wow, there's some cool stuff out there that I get to do. So one of the cool things I got to participate in was an exercise we were going to do that didn't quite pan out the way we had planned it. Do the, the law. Actually, the law was staying in the way, but that's what we're there for. So to get your son, right? <laughs> so we did an exercise. It ended up just being us as U.S. forces going out to the desert in Africa. And I got an experience to get on an MP-22 Osprey and fought the desert. And I thought, whoa, 
that's pretty amazing. They had the back of it open. I was sitting there watching the clouds go by and I thought, that's awesome. This is the moment. Like this is one of those things I'll never get to experience otherwise. And then of course we got to watch the flyovers that C-130 stayed out in the desert. And we got to also get a ride back on a C-130 with them loading yeah. up different cars into the back. So I got to see it fully loaded. And I was just thinking, this is amazing. And another thing on my deployment that also stuck out to me was I got to take pictures with camels. Like, who gets <laughs> to do that as a lawyer? I mean, you can go on vacation and go to Africa and take pictures of camels all you want. But the idea was there I am out in uniform working with our foreign partners. And I'm just taking pictures of camels because they're there. And so that was pretty <laughs> awesome. I enjoyed that. That's awesome. I'm kind of slightly disappointed that your pinch me moment wasn't, you know, in the courtroom where somebody finally said, you can't handle the truth. You know, but, you know, maybe that doesn't happen every day. No, no, it doesn't happen every day. I mean, courtroom moments, we deal with some strange cases, though. So there's always stories to tell. I believe it. Well, very good. Thank you, Karina. I really appreciate you taking the time to share your experiences, help us better understand how to become a JAG, why the JAG exists, the relationship to the Constitution and your commission. But I know that we didn't cover everything. Obviously, there's so much more to the career field. And I want to give people the opportunity to ask those questions. If they want to reach out to you, what is the best way for them to do that? If they are in the military, you can just find me on, you know, military email on the global that works well. Anybody else, I mean, I'm available via email to answer questions as well. Great. Yeah. So they can reach out to the Air Force Officer Podcast. They can send the email to airforceofficerpodcast at gmail.com and we'll forward that on to you and facilitate that conversation from there. Well, very good. One final question for you, and we kind of went into it a little bit, but want to hit it more directly. Karina, what does it mean to be an officer? I think being an officer, it sounds cliche, but it means being a leader. And it means being someone who holds themselves to high standards. It means someone who has taken on a serious responsibility to support and defend what matters most. And to me personally, the valuable thing I found in, in the experience is that I can be a leader. And even if it's like with paralegals in an office, even if I'm never a squadron commander, it's just the idea that I'm leaving an impact on other people and that I can set that example and perhaps be that person to help somebody else along the way so they can progress in their career. And Honestly, it's such a unique experience because not that many people that we have in the United States will ever get to be in the military, maybe, or make that choice. And so to be one of the few who can say, I am a United States Air Force officer, and this is what matters to me. This is why I took the oath. To me, it means setting an example, honestly, like being somebody who can leave the impact for everybody else and to make sure the mission is done at the end of the day. Excellent. Couldn't agree more. Thank you so much, Captain Karina Osgood. It's been a pleasure having you here on the podcast, again, sharing your experience, helping everybody, including me, better understand the JAG Corps, what it means to be a JAG officer. And because I know it's going to come up, go ask JA. Yes, that is the line. Go ask. Yeah, just ask, actually. Because that's the acronym too, JA. So just ask. Here we are. Always here. There we go. Just ask, but know that they're going to say, it depends. Yeah. And it's going to infuriate you sometimes, but that's what we're here <laughs> Helping you out. All right. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Okay, Reed. So the first thing that I want to talk to you about, and just make sure that we understand exactly why this is the case. Karina got into it in the episode. She talked about the promotions process for JAG officers. They become a first lieutenant as soon as they EAD. And then after six months, they're going to put on captain, which is insanely fast when you compare it to what the rest of the Air Force, line of the Air Force is doing. And I want to make sure that we all understand why. Why is this the case? Well, first of all, with rank comes more pay, right? And, you know, these officers, they've earned the additional pay. They have their bachelor's degree. They've gone to law school. They passed the bar. They are professionals. And so we should compensate them accordingly, right? Yeah, no, and, and no real beef with that, right? But pay is not enough, right? Rank means something in the Air Force. And when you give someone first lieutenant, and especially when you give them captain, things change. Yes. People see them differently. They interact with them differently. And 
that can't be just by accident. That can't be just so that they are paid a little bit more. So the conversation that I want to have is why would the Air Force want to give a JAG officer captain after only six months? What is the thinking there? And I'm sorry to all the lieutenants paying attention, but people kind of discredit, discount what lieutenants have to offer. It's not right. It bugs mm -hmm. me. It always has. But when people see a lieutenant, they see young, they see inexperienced, and they question pretty much everything they say. It's not <laughs> right. It just is. Yeah. What do they say? You can't spell lost without LT, right? Yeah, exactly. So, and there's a very distinct line. Colin, I know you and I have both felt it. Mm -hmm. When you do something impressive as a lieutenant, either first or second, people are like, yeah, good job, you know, and like real, lots of attaboys and, you know, and then they don't do that when you're a captain. Nope. The only thing you get is, what are you doing? You know, it's, if you're not always crushing it, you're like, you're an idiot now. <laughs> so it's a very, and it's immediate. It as is, soon as it you is put immediate. the two bars on it, everything changes. Yeah. It's immediate. And so I think that's the biggest thing is they need, when they walk in the room, they have to be trusted. And I wish it were different. I wish that we could find a way to give our lieutenants more credit for what they've done. Yeah. We've talked about how I think, you know, second lieutenant should be three years long. First lieutenant should be three years long and captain should be shorter. Yeah. You know, but whatever. I'm not king for a day. I can't make those changes. But that is what it is. And that's what it is. They need to have the credibility when they walk in the room. When you see a captain, you have different expectations, bottom line. Yeah. And so that's like Karina loves to do. Let's put a practical application to this. Imagine that she talks about it in the episode. The JAG is there to advise a commander. Well, the commander is probably an 05 and 06 or something like that. And there's this conversation happening between an 05 and 06 about what to do for non-judicial punishment, maybe that it's mission related. Can I use this ordinance at this time and place? That sort of thing. And they're turning to the O3, the captain JAG officer and saying, what's your advice? And that commander, for better or for worse, is going to struggle to have that same conversation with a second or a first lieutenant. Like just picture that in your mind. The conversation is gonna be at a much higher levels of trust between an 05 and an 03 than it would be otherwise. Yeah, and those are the facts. You know, can't change it. You can earn that. You can earn that over time, mm -hmm. right? I've seen that, especially with prior enlisted officers who, you know, come in with ton of credibility because of their experience and background, but that can take time. And there are occasions where we don't have time right. for you to build that. Deployment is a perfect example. And believe me, the lawyers are involved. Oh, yeah. You know, can I drop this? What are the rules of engagement? You know, all that kind of stuff. You know, it's interesting. You'll go if, you know, when you're in and you see, you know, three and four star generals getting advice, it's from an 0506 JAG officer. Right. But they've got a whole crew of 03s and 04s that are also providing advice. And they have to have it immediately. They can't have that glimmer of doubt. And so that's why it is. And that's just it. That's, that's how it goes. Yeah. So I wanted to make sure that we all understood that. What are some things that you felt like we needed to highlight out of the interview? So you highlighted it very briefly, but I really want to hammer it because she brought it out and it's something that I'd always heard and it really stuck with me is that lawyers advise, commanders decide. Mm -hmm. And again, as a good build on from our previous episode about authority and power where we talked about that with Johnny Jopling and this idea of the source of the authority being the same. That is an incredible responsibility where lawyers aren't deciding. Commanders are deciding. Right. I thought it was interesting that she highlighted that. I've heard commanders tell me that, you know, in certain settings, you'll be like, well, JAG advised this. And then the commanders say, lawyers advise, commanders decide. Where does that responsibility lie? You can't point to your lawyer and say, well, they recommended that I do this. If it goes south, it's on the commander. Yeah. I mean, it's not going to be that often that the commander is going to go against the advice of JA, but it does happen. Yeah, it does, especially operationally. You know, when you're taking risks or evaluating the quote right thing to do, 
You know, that's the other thing. These are not easy decisions. This is not binary. Right. This is not, oh, oh, well, according to this line in the code, oh, easy. I know what to do now. No, it's not. Which is why we tell everybody what? What do we tell them, Colin? Call J.A. Call J.A. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) But I just love that she highlighted that. That's what they are trained to do, to advise. But the responsibility to decide lies with the commander. Yeah, and what you're saying there, Reed, gets to what I wanted to bring out again, is that there is no, you know, at the highest levels of operations and strategy and what the Air Force is trying to do, there isn't going to be a black and white yes or no checklist item for every decision that needs to be made. And yet the law is still everywhere. And the way that I like to think about this is, as we've said in previous episodes, that there are both written and unwritten rules for everything. And that they're going to apply to you whether you know what they are or not. Well, this is one of those things that is definitely going to apply to you. The law is going to apply to you no matter what, no matter who you are, where you are, when you are, whether it's specifically written down in a UCMJ article or there's just the unwritten intent, it's still going to apply to you. And so that is why the commander has on speed dial J.A., Yeah. And that is why we as officers and really everybody in the Air Force, officer, enlisted, civilian, you name it, should be comfortable with calling JA and asking those questions because the law is everywhere and it will always apply. Yeah, I you're totally right. That leads me to the last thing I wanted to talk about. The longer I've been in, the more rank and the more responsibility that has come my way, the more I interact with them. And the Mm -hmm. more it's opened my eyes to exactly what you're talking about, that the law is everywhere. I think it's really important. And this is what I wanted to share. Your relationship with them, it will not always be pleasant, right? These are not necessarily your favorite days, but the interaction needs to not be adversarial. Right. You can have a bad day. You can have a bad situation, but these folks are resources for us. They are resources for us to use to get to the right thing to help the Air Force, to help our airmen, and to help us. And so, yeah, it's going to be lousy when you've got a DUI to deal with and you're calling them and they're giving you advice. But that's no excuse. You can disagree without being disagreeable. That's what I'm talking about. It needs to be a professional and positive interaction, not adversarial. And so far that's been my experience. And, you know, yeah, they will sometimes come in and be like, no, sir, no, ma'am, you cannot do that. You know, I've had those hard conversations in the legal office. Yeah. And yet it was not adversarial. These are our people. They are airmen. They are on our team. Yeah. They are wearing our uniform. They are on team America, just like we are. So don't make it adversarial. Yeah, you could say that about not just the JA, but security forces, OSI, even, you know, like the chaplain, the medical corps, you know, let's just extend it to everybody who wears the uniform. They're not our adversaries. There are bad apples. There are people who make stupid decisions that adversely affect other people. Yes, that does happen. But by and large, everybody who is wearing the uniform or is hired by the Air Force to conduct the mission or support the mission is on our side. Yep. Yeah, totally agree. I really appreciate Captain Mosgood coming on and giving us her perspective. I thought she had some really good things to think about and a different way of looking at the problems. You know, I'm a very ops-centric guy in the way I look at the world. And so to talk with her about her deployed experience and to hear the legal perspective on things I thought was really insightful. And Hopefully it's given our audience something to think about, like you said, Colin, because the law is out there and they are out there writing the rules to this game that you're playing in, whether you like it or not. So probably a pretty good idea to call J.A. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, I can't say it enough in this episode. Yep. So thanks for listening to this week's episode of Commission Ed. And now call J.A. <laughs>